Now, folks, these, um, these first few slides, I think there are three or four of them. Um, it's like it's all the same image, uh, but I've brought along a number of them just to show you the enormous variety. Within these patterns dictated, in this case, by the rules within a Greek and Russian orthodoxy, it's like the, the, each one is exactly the same as the next, but of course done by different artists and over a period of, of uh, many hundreds of years, the variations within the formula. So they are formulaic, but in fact within the formula there, there's a great variety of, um, of artistic expression. But the, the patterns now are going to be the same. Uh, these, of course, are um, icons, which means they are paintings on uh, blocks of wood. Uh, the, the, the surface of the wood is gessoed, and then um, lots of gold leaf, of course, and, uh, and, and then the paint. And uh, when, when, when you're in the presence of them, very often, uh, whether they're small or large, very often over time the wood has warped slightly and even split. So they have a very organic feel to them because you still have the, the presence of, of wood which is, uh, which is breathing. Uh, obviously the center of the entire composition is the enthroned spirit. Now we talked about the enthroned Madonna yesterday. This could still be considered a enthroned Madonna because this is a wisdom figure and the wisdom figures uh, in all of these come from the wisdom books in the Old Testament are of course the female voice in the Old Testament. And some of the most beautiful passages in the Old Testament are in fact the wisdom books. And she is enthroned and her redness is her fiery energy, her like like the sun, like the, the heat of, of of the heat of divinity at the source of all that is. So that she's in the the circular sun mandorla like figure. She is enthroned. She's wearing uh, red clothing. Very often her flesh, so to speak, is red. It's not flesh so much. Is a kind of like energetic flush. Uh, that, that, that is her body. And even, uh, she's even seated, or, or sh her, her feet uh, rest on red cushions. Um, to the left of the composition, to, to the right of, of, of Sophia, is Theodicus, the Christ bearer, the God bearer, uh, Mary, and holding, and th this is a piece of iconography, again, in the Greek and Ruth Russian Orthodox Church, uh, the Jesus is a tiny, tiny little figure inside her breast, not down in the womb area, but the understanding that the, that the, that the Christ's flame is in the heart area. And on the other side, uh, the divine prophet, uh, Jesus' uh, cousin, John the Baptist, the great um, fierce desert uh, father who, of course, uh, was a prophet, uh, a contemporary. They were, as you know, born six months apart. And he is the prophet who went ahead of Jesus to foretell uh, Jesus' life on work. Way, 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 way off in the background is God the Father, sort of attending, watching what's happening, but at a great, great far removed distance. And at the very top level, layers of heaven, sort of uh, the, the linear movement in terms of uh, uh, understanding of a landscape which goes back and back and back and back and back and back on forever. And in the very center of heaven is the empty throne. The empty throne signifies the seat is empty because wisdom who dwells in the highest reaches of divinity has come down from the throne, come down to live among us. And this is one of the most powerful concepts in the Old Testament, and it's a concept that we must cling to as women. Uh, many of us, or perhaps all of us, <coughs> raised in patriarchy, in one religion or another, it doesn't matter, uh, Judaic or uh, the many, many um, manifestations of, of the Christian message through time. So that the understanding um, that the Greek and the Orthodox churches uh, have understood and held this close to their own hearts, whereas it never reached 
in terms of iconography never came into the West. The West was dominated by, by the, the mystery of the Trinity, and therefore, it, it's, it's what I said yesterday, the, the person who knew nothing about Christianity but just heard it was some, a story, something about two men and a bird. We have, we have been dominated only, uh, but we have been controlled and dominated by that central image of two men and a bird. And Mary off to the side someplace. Of course, hugely important in the Catholic Church, but of course, um, wars were fought over this in terms of Catholics uh, in, in versus Protestants which is, of course, the whole history of, um, of hundreds of years in European society, with one side slaying the other uh, in, uh, just because of these theological disputes. So uh, we maintain in the Catholic Church, I say we because certainly I am born and bred and continue inside the Catholic tradition. I don't mean the Catholic Church uh, in terms of Mass on Sunday and, and uh, you know, uh, having the priests over on Sunday afternoon for supper, uh, for, for Sunday afternoon su uh, a meal. But, uh, I, and I don't feel that I'm in the fringes. I feel I'm very at the very heart of my own energy in the church is energy for women in terms of women's spirituality. And obviously that is not um, in any way, it's not inside a Catholic box. I've been outside the Catholic box. I mean, I was outside the Catholic box even when I lived in the monastery. So, um, relying uh, on my own inner Sophia to lead me, to guide me, to fly me uh, from one role to another really. Uh, I've, I've gone through many, like all of us, gone through many, I've worn many cloaks, many habits, many manifestations in my life. Um, and this is certainly uh, one of the most deeply satisfying, this, uh, this being, being with groups of women from time to time. Uh, because believe me, you give me as much as, you, as I might be giving you. So here is divine wisdom. Uh, and I want you to think about this and pray about this for the rest of the day. She comes down. She comes out of that place. Whatever, however you, whatever that place is to you, however you see it or feel it or be it, she's there. Call it the Gaia principle. Call it the wisdom of creation. Call it the wisdom that makes certain beetles eat only certain leaves so that certain trees only grow in certain places. Call it the very fabric, biological fabric, the wisdom of, the wisdom of everything. That she lives among us and that wisdom is as simple as something like a certain beetle eating a certain leaf because this is where the earth needs that to happen in this particular place. The Gaia principle is everything. It is all that is. It's all we ever will know and think about and pray with and in. Uh, and that she's this beautiful, enthroned, bloody red energy seated in our heart. Enthroned in our heart is what we as women uh, need to really be with. And um, you might want to go again to the library and uh, you know, get some of these, uh, get some of these images, photograph them, live with them, have icons in your, um, in your presence. This is the pattern. Let's just look at them now. Um, and each one will be different, and yet th they are all the same, as I said. This is the uh, God the Father is a little bit larger here than he usually is little bit different with Mary uh, reaching, I love the Mary reaching toward wisdom. And the throne here uh, being held not by multiple angels, but an angel, angels on either side. It's a gorgeous composition, isn't it? And the, 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 the center, she centers herself. Here is the center of the composition. And it's framed and uh, inflamed, framed and inflamed by her own wings. Again, I can only, I, I tend to keep coming back to this Gaia principle, but I mean, Sophia is the Greek word for wisdom. It's like, who, who is she? She is, Sophia means wisdom. And it's the wisdom of the universe, manifesting in the simplest detail of the factual, um, biological level of, uh, of life to the deepest levels of spirituality. But, um, but what I would like for you to remember and meditate on is that this 
this red burning female wisdom is seated, you are seated in her lamp. And she is, she is seated in your heart. Uh, these, one of the great wisdom figures in my life from the time I was a teenager is uh, St. Hildegard. I first knew about her when I was a teenager in my Catholic Girls Academy in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I first saw her work when I was a teenager. Uh, it's called In the Lap of St. Hildegard. Uh, she, doing her mystic galactic paintings and I, uh, in a sort of embryonic, I very often paint myself in a kind of quasi-embryonic way, like I'm half finished. I always feel like I'm always half finished, that every day I get a little bit, maybe a little bit more finished, but that I very often dress myself in a cloak, which is kind of like a, a, an uh, in a kind of cocoon, so that I, it's a cocoon I crawl back into and then can crawl back out of. This is one of the, um, after my illness in uh, the year 2000, um, at one point during that year, I think it was when I, I still had the double pneumonia, I just, yes it was, because it was my birthday, my birthday in February 2002, and I'm Aquarian, and, um, and I just remember, you know, praying, you know, I was all hooked to oxygen and having one of those machines that makes oxygen rumbling through the house and the dogs tripping over the tanks and wires and so on. Um, I just remember thinking, kind of waking up thinking, oh, it's my birthday. And I just thought, if I don't get to the studio, I hadn't been in the studio for a long time, if I don't get to the studio and paint, I'm not going to get well. And. Um, at that point, I had no use of my right arm at all. The only way I could paint was to literally hold, sit, at a, sit at a desk and hold my arm and hold my brush and paint like this, and then move it over to the palette or the, clean the brush or whatever. And I rummaged around. In fact, um, I have a box uh, in the studio, which is just a kind of collection of things that folks have been here and don't want to drag it back to Indianapolis or you know what I mean so they just leave it in this box for someone else to use. I rummaged around in there and found a, a little pad of watercolor and some watercolors and I thought okay I can do this and I can show you this afternoon in the studio I'll show you that first watercolor I've kept it and um, and that I painted my way back into recovery. And then that June is when I had the, the shoulder surgery for the shoulder replacement. And then I had to go through another period of healing. But I was painting again by the autumn. So it was, it was just a very, it was a, a deeply contemplative year. Mm -hmm. I was obviously housebound. And, um, and then later that year in September is when I fell and broke this arm in three places. So. It was, uh, it, was, it was quite an interesting year. Um, it was my year of dismemberment. I lost my limbs. So uh, this is me in the lap of St. Hildegard. And these are about, these, these paintings are all small. The, these, uh, I ended up working on, in three sizes. Uh, one size, just five by seven inches. And I think these are about nine by, I think this one is about nine by 12 inches. This, her arm sweeps down and kind of just disappears into my body and my head sort of sweeps back and kind of dissolves into her body. These are tongues of fire, which um, uh, in, in her own manuscripts, there are sort of tongues of fire like that. I'll, 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 ta I'll show you it in, in a few minutes, uh, one of those images. I, this is also St. Hildegard. Oh, this is called the seeing of St. Hildegard, one of her mystic visions. And this is the, the Benedictine, Benedictine habit, which, as I say, is the same today as it was then. This is one from one of her manuscripts. Uh, here, here is Hildegard. This is a, a 12th century manuscript, about 100 years after she died. Here she is receiving the fiery visions from the above. That's kind of what that, those red, red movements were in, in that last painting. Um, this is uh, her prioress, uh, a, sister, a, dame, a sister Joanna in the monastery, 
who was also a learned woman and was able to um, uh, write down some of her visions. And uh, this is the, um, the monk, uh, Vomar, who was given to her, so to speak, to transcribe um, because she herself did not write. So her work uh, was dictated and, uh, and written down by this nun and this monk in the monastery. And uh, another archetypal imagery of the fiery vision uh, coming down from above, the flames of the spirit inspiring her and then uh, she um, writing them down or, or dictating them and also dictating to the artists who uh, began uh, doing, uh, doing images based on uh, what she was seeing. Her music she probably wrote herself, although I, don't, I can't speak to that, but she certainly is, uh, is more and more considered uh, an aston one, you know, one of the early uh, astonishing uh, composers. She clearly was one of these huge world minds and uh, part of the, um, the, 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 the 12th century in all of Europe was uh, an explosion of, uh, it's when the universities began, um, it was an explosion of energy at every level. Creative, it's when all the great cathedrals started being built, sculpture, painting, visionary, uh, visionary people, uh, men and women in various monasteries. It was, in fact, uh, Joseph Campbell um, calls it the greatest uh, century in, 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 Western, uh, in the Western world, uh, which is something coming from uh, Joseph Campbell, because, in fact, his great love, as you know, was Eastern. Uh, but in his 20s, he, he, you know, he, he went East looking for wisdom, and yet he himself, and he calls, he calls Chart Cathedral the equivalent of the, the Parthenon, or in other words, the peak of classical uh, culture and beauty. Uh, he makes a relationship between the Parthenon in Athens and, uh, Sh and Chart Cathedral, um, 30 miles south of uh, Paris. This is a very important image. It's not, it's not a hugely I important you know, piece of art. Um, but it's certainly um, quite beautiful. But it's important for this reason. This is a, a very famous, uh, again, talking about the 12th century, this is a very famous um, Benedictine abbot in the 12th century. His name is Suso, S-U-S-O, a great scholar, a man of great heart, uh, a great, great passion, just great energy one of the really wise men of the 12th century. And this is an image of him enthroned, as, as we, we talk now about the throne as being the seat of uh, presence and of, of authority, and how this moved through time, with bishops being enthroned, and abbots enthroned, and then kings enthroned, and queens enthroned, and as I say, now when you get elected to the Senate, you get a, a throne inside the Senate building. In other words, to be enthroned is to take on, to sit in the seat of authority, to speak from the authority of that seat. So to speak from a senate is to speak, you know, however you want to define political wisdom. Abbot speaks from his throne, what a bishop speaks from his throne, the place for disseminating spiritual wisdom or political wisdom in the case of the secular world. So here, this is a beautiful image because this is an image that he himself would have wanted painted. And he, he, he would have asked for this to be painted in order to celebrate this great vision that he received within himself in his own prayer. He opens his cloak and what does he, what is inside the cloak? Is this figure, um, this female figure inside him, his own manifestation of anima, and in the, female's, uh, in the female's lap, this is his soul. So th this image is telling you, if you could open your cloak and say to the world, here is my soul, what image would you want to be there? Uh, so Suso is saying, at the heart of my being is Lady Wisdom. And she is sitting, I am enthroned in her, 
she is enthroned in me and I, my soul, is enthroned in her. So that the soul is the child. Very often the soul, in the iconography through time all over the world, the soul is very often shown as an, as an infant, um, as this precious little, this precious little ball of energy you can, you can hold to yourself, literally, physically, and um, the, the, the center of your very being. So I give you this image because I want you to carry this image within yourself. I want you to be able to, in your own, sitting in your own, being enthroned, sitting in your own place wherever you pray, to be able to feel inside your cloak Lady Wisdom sitting at your center and you are sitting in her lamp. She is embracing you. I want you to live embraced by Holy Wisdom, by Lady Wisdom, by Divine Sophia. And I'm serious about this. If there's one image I would ask you to take away from these four days, it's that image. And never not believe it. Give yourself over in the most intense act of faith so that you have this center. And no matter what the travails of your life, the great joys of your life, I mean, it, it's all related to living a wise life in, centered in her energy. And remember that her energy is a burning, flaming energy of love and um, heat the heat of creativity in your life. A beautiful image of, of um, Theodicus, uh, the Christ bearer, uh, Mary, uh, Jesus sitting in her lap, and she's sitting inside a chalice, inside a container, and the, the juices, the, 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 the grace, the, the, the watery substance, uh, flows out from the chalice into this pond and two people have come forward, pilgrims have come forward and they, uh, one is reaching down to get water, the one on the right reaching down to, to, take, to take this liquid, this elixir of life and drink it and this person has his, his, his hand to his mouth, he has taken this elixir of life. So wisdom as the fountain of life, as the source of life, this fiery liquid source of life. And another, um, uh, again, same theme, different image. This is an unfinished manuscript, uh, not a terribly good drawing, but that doesn't matter. Very often, and, and this is something else to always remember about uh, creativity, the power of the image can be carried inside a less than adequate composition or technique or in any way. Don't worry when you're, when you're working. Don't worry about, oh my God, this is, you know, these colors are right. Oh, this isn't working. This isn't. Don't worry about that. If you are intent on your image, the, it will all come, it will all resolve around the content and you don't have to worry about, uh, worry about it being, you know, an interesting painting or an interesting piece of work, whatever it is. Um, and try working with this understanding of, and make your own understanding of Sophia living inside uh, at the very center of your being. Now here is holy wisdom, the, the wisdom pouring out like water, feeding all these different people. Here she is up here enthroned in this watery wisdom and it's, it's like a huge halo around this composition, um, pouring right from her breast. And the wonder of this manuscript is that it's pouring right into, each person is getting their own little fountain, specifically directed to each person. Uh, here's, a, here's a soldier, here's a crusader, here are three women uh, at the bottom, uh, one, the musician in the center, uh, this is obviously a scholar. This is a, 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 a nun who illuminates manuscripts. Here's an architect. I've never understood quite what this profession, this woman here is. This is, this is a woman um, 
uh, and but I've never understood what this this palette or this sphere is all about. Doesn't matter. So we have this wonderful relationship between men and women. Um, in whatever our, wherever we are in life, whatever our profession, whatever our interests, whatever our focus, every one of us has a different focus. All of those things are different. Thank God, how wonderful to celebrate the variety of our lives when we come together. Uh, it isn't, you know, lesser than or more than. It's simply that we are all doing the work of the Spirit in whatever way that is ordained and that we all are fed from the same source. This wisdom flowing, uh, this watery, beautiful uh, liquidity flowing from the center of the universe into, directly into each of us, into, I mean, how specific is this? We open our mouth and it flows right in. 